Hey there, Brandon Harvey here. Before we get started with the show, I have to tell you something important about the guest we're featuring today. As you know, issue three of the Good Newspaper has recently been released, and we're so excited about it. And inside of every issue of the newspaper, we choose to feature a story of an incredible human who is doing really important work in the world. In the first issue, we featured photographer and activist Devin Allen. In the second issue, we featured United Fort Iran's founder, Firuze Mamoudi. And inside of issue three, we've chosen to feature Ilwad Elman's story. And she is my guest today. And she's been a part of groundbreaking piece work in Somalia. Her story is so powerful, and we'll get into that today. However, we dive deeper into her story and the impact of her work in our latest issue. So I don't want you to miss out. Subscribe to The Good Newspaper at shop.goodgoodgood.co, or you can just order a single issue if that's what you need, and you'll get The Good Newspaper delivered right to your door. There's so much good happening in the world, and we want you to be a part of it. Okay, now here's the show. In 2010, the conflict in Somalia was raging heavily, and the majority of Mogadishu and the south-central regions of Somalia were lost to the control of al-Qaeda-linked terrorist group al-Shabaab. Ilwad Elman, living in Canada at the time, left the safety of her new home in North America to return to her home country of Somalia. Even in the midst of terrorism, conflict, and violence, she's remained in Somalia ever since, working for peace, security, and empowerment in creative and innovative ways. I'm truly honored by the fact that she is our guest on Sounds Good today. I'm challenged by the way that Ilwad Elman has chosen to lean into the pain she saw in her own country when she had the opportunity to lead a comfortable and easy life. She chose to show up in a place that was difficult in order to make an impact. Today, Ilwad Elman is known as a Somali-Canadian social activist. She works at the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center in Mogadishu, alongside her mother, Fartoon Adan, the NGO's founder. She was voted the African Young Personality of the Year during the 2016 African Youth Awards, and I think that's amazing and perfectly describes her. There are too many things to say about Ilwad, so you'll just have to hear her story to understand how wild and brave her life has turned out thus far. I say this with full sincerity that she is one of my all-time favorite people we have ever brought onto the show. I am Brendan Harvey, and this is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have hopeful conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. So without any further ado, let's jump straight into Ilwad's story. Ilwad, you have been traveling a lot recently. You're back in Somalia right now, right? Yes, I am in Mogadishu, Somalia right now. Amazing. Tell me a little bit about Mogadishu. I don't know very much at all. I'd love to hear about it. Mogadishu, it's a beautiful place. I think it's a land of many contradictions. There's so much chaos, but so much calm. There's conflict, but beauty. There's love, there's laughter, there's joy, there's incredible momentum right now. And it's, it's a place that's, after 25, 26, 27 years of conflict, is slowly getting back on its feet. It's where I was born. It's the place I feel most grounded. And it's home. And you said you were born in Mogadishu, but you didn't grow up there, right? No, I was born in Somalia. I left when I was about a year and a half. Um, like many other hundreds of thousands, millions of other Somalis after the war broke out, we, we fled the country. How far into the war did you leave? Was it, you know, immediate or was there a tipping point? So the war, um, started in 1991. I was born in 89 and, um, we left in 92. Yeah. So after that, my mom and my sisters, I have a younger sister and older sister, the, the four of us left and we lived in a refugee camp in Kenya for a couple of years. It was called Otango and then later turned into Didab, which is now the world's largest refugee camp. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yes. And um, after that, we got asylum in Canada, where I spent the majority of my life until 2010 when I moved back to Somalia. Growing up in Canada and I guess even this refugee camp, what did you know about Somalia growing up? Like, what did you imagine about it? Because I would imagine that you didn't have enough memories when you left to kind of carry those with you. 
No, I mean, I left Somalia at such a young age and even life living in, in the refugee camp is, is still very blurry. I was very young there as well, too. So my youngest memories really are from my childhood and my life in Canada and living in Canada, living in that bubble of privilege and comfort that me and my family were so fortunate to have. The only real thing that we ever saw about Somalia was what we saw in mainstream media. And that is no different as how it's depicted today. Suffering, war, famine, conflict, just a failed state. And for me and my family, we felt even, I think, more attached to Somalia, even though we were not physically there because we just lost so much. All of the association and feelings I had about my, my native country were all very negative. My mom lost a lot of her brothers that were killed. My father was killed in Somalia. We literally left everything that we had behind when we fled to Kenya. So there was no looking back and constantly seeing depicted my native country in mainstream media as just this mess, this hole of suffering left very much to be desired. So I, I felt like the whole time I was in Canada, I didn't really have any positive representations of my country. And what initially did compel me to go back is those very roots that, that I did have in Somalia still at that time, which were, my father's legacy, the work that he incepted with my, with my mother that did follow us to Canada, actually. When people would hear our last name and learn about the work that my father did, and they would cry. They'd be so emotional that they would actually meet his children. And that was really intriguing that people, even in Canada, that were refugees like us that had fled the country, remembered his impact in Somalia and felt touched just by seeing his children and that sparked a whole new kind of interest in Somalia for me. So I wanted to know what is it that he did and you know, so. Tell me a little bit more about your father. My father was an ardent human rights activist in Somalia. He, he was actually a street child when he was a child himself. He wasn't orphaned. So his, his father and his mother were around, but in a big, big family, he was very much neglected. So he used to be on the streets and polish shoes. And then um, after the Italian colonization, I mean, for many years, they still had a lot of social support services for Somalia. And he was one of the, the children that had the opportunity to benefit from uh, an educational program where he was taken to Italy when he was still very young. So he was in his teens. So he went to Italy and studied there, then got his master's in Germany, and then wow. became an electrical engineer and in the 80s moved back to Somalia. And what inspired him to move back? I think it was his upbringing. He was neglected by his own family, by his society, lived on the streets when he had a family that was quite well off. And he really managed by his own grit and persistence and drive to benefit from this opportunity for education abroad and got it. And then while he was abroad, he studied and came back with a very important trade. And I think he came back to Somalia to give back, give back and try to create a more enabling and positive environment for the other children that were in the position that he was once in. And that's exactly what he did. So he set up businesses throughout Muktishu. Most of them were electrical shops and mechanic shops. And he was hiring only young people that were orphaned on the streets, so street children. And he was teaching them the skills, getting them off the street. A lot of them had substance and drug abuse, and the most prominent one at the time, and even until now, is homeless youth and children sniffing glue. So he would wean them off the drugs, and then he would hire them. And then when he did that, he would give them a whole new status in society. And his whole workforce was people that lived life like him prior to the opportunity that he got. So he came back to pay it forward. And then when the war broke out, he shifted his focus to not just youth that had been abandoned or were battling drug addictions, but those that were being co-opted into clan-based militias by the warlords. So he was giving them an alternative to escape a life of violence, to stop being used by unscrupulous warlords and war profiteers by telling them to drop the guns, pick up the pen, would teach them the technical trade skills and then hire them back in. And he was so successful in doing this that he was demobilizing young men and even children by the thousands. 
till today, his slogan, which was drop the gun, pick up the pen, can still be seen marked up in the ruins of different streets in Muktishu. That's so interesting. I, I can't imagine growing up with a father like that. You know, you grew up in Canada. It sounds like he was still in Somalia doing this work. What kind of relationship did you have with him growing up? And, and what did you see him as this larger than life figure? What was that like for you? When I used to hear about the work that he did and the innovations and what seems like such practical solutions to some of the issues that we're still facing with 21 years after his death, I found to be incredible and inspiring, but also larger than life. Sometimes he would sound like a fictional character, the way that he was described. He had dreadlocks and he wore these pastel colored shorts and he just skipped to a whole different beat than what was the norm in Mukdisha at that time. So it's everything that I really know about him and his impact has been passed on to me from both my mother and from just other people around the world, other Somalis that I've been fortunate enough to meet that share these different experiences with me and my sisters. But I don't actually remember in any encounter with him. He was killed in 1996. And by that time, we were still quite young to fully understand the gravity of his presence. And so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any actual memory of him or being with him, but I just feel so fortunate to be able to learn about him continuously through these stories and anecdotes and encounters that people cherish so much from little encounters that they had with him. And my mother has been the biggest time vault, if you will, of those memories. She has really dedicated her life to his legacy and to us, my sisters and I. It's because of her that I'm also back in Somalia now trying to do my part in honoring his legacy. Tell me about the process of moving back to Mogadishu because had you visited growing up before you moved back? We visited one time in 2000 and it okay. was for only three days. It was after my mother's older brother was killed and she really needed to be back in Somalia and she couldn't leave us behind because we were too young. And it was just the four of us. So on that one occasion, we came back for less than five days. Wow. and Yeah, not enough time to really get a full grasp of the place. Not at all. And then we went back to Canada. And growing up there, my mom always told us that one day she's going to go back. As soon as you girls are in all... Her benchmark has always been as soon as you girls are all in high school. So <laughs> when, when my younger sister was in high school... And I was 16 at the time, and um, my older sister was 18. That's when my mom went back to Somalia. And what was that like for you guys to be solo without her? I mean, I think it's just a reflection of how she's raised us. It's always just been us, the four of us. And even while we were in Canada, we everyone worked. Everyone went to school. Uh, I remember my first job, I was 13. Um, we, all, we, all, we were a team, you know, we worked together, we provided together. And my mom, she lost my dad, and she had all three of us by the age of 24. She lived as a refugee, moved to a new country, taught herself a new language, still went to school in Canada. I mean, all of that she did on her own. So who is to say that when she finally felt like the weight and burden of, or, you know, the responsibility of really having to take care of her children who are now old enough to take care of herself, that we should not be able to step up. And that's what we did. My sisters and I organized and, you know, did what we needed to do to continue with our education and pay rent and take care of ourselves because we certainly were old enough and able to do that. And she went back to Somalia to really pick up the pieces of what was left of the work that she and my father had incepted. And so we fast forward a few years and you go out to join her in the work that she's doing in Somalia. What was it like when you first arrived? What did that feel like? By the time that I had made the decision to go to Somalia, it had already been four years that my mom was back in Somalia. And she went at arguably one of the most dangerous times. I, much of my motivation for going came from the desperate need to actually see her. 
to understand why she was there when we also needed her. But everything that we saw on TV, on the news, was just a bomb happened here. This area has been taken over by this group or she'd call us and then we'd lose contact with her for weeks at a time. I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I really just wanted to know if she was okay and to see for myself what it is that is really happening there. Because I, every time we'd speak to her, she'd be so positive. And then we'd hang up the phone and then we'd look at what's on the media. And that does not reflect at all the voice that you know, the, the courage and the positivity that she carried when she was on the phone with us. So I felt like she was just trying to make things lighter so that we wouldn't worry, but we were still worried. So I went to go visit her and my plan was to stay for a month, maximum three months, but really just, it was just a check on her. And when I came to Somalia, I really was confronted with everything that I worried about. Everything that I saw, it, it shook me to my core. I mean, when you hear about war or conflict, you, you never really are able to understand it really until you're in it. Everything that we see in Hollywood productions and big movies was in my backyard. Mortars, bombings, roadside bombs, everything going off. And that level of calamity, that constant, it was, um, it was really something that, I will never forget my initial response to it. But then amidst that, I also saw how hard she was trying to really help other people. How early in the morning she would go to the center and how many people needed her just the same way that we needed her, if not more. How many kids were calling her mom. And I, I fell in love with the work that she was doing instantly. And I felt also a responsibility to help her because I saw the level of resistance she was getting. And what was really heartbreaking for me is that much of this resistance was coming from our own family, my uncles on my father's side, who felt that if she's just a woman with only daughters, she didn't have a son to carry on any kind of legacy, who does she think she is to try to run an organization in the name of their son? How can a woman carry a legacy? And seeing basically every two things that she works on and puts two and two together, there are people working behind her to unravel all of the progress that she was making. And it actually got violence too. One of my uncles actually shot up one of the centers that she just was opening a new program and had a launch and hundreds of people were there and there was balloons and it was just a beautiful day. And one of my uncles actually came and, just fired a round of um, gunshots into the air for people to disperse and to leave. And they did. And I've never seen my mom at a moment of, I think, um, so much weakness where she physically lunged at him because she was so angry. And then that's also one of the moments that I realized that I can't leave her. And if we that are also in many ways are considered, excuse me, <laughs> it always makes me kind of more emotional thinking about this, but if we as women that are educated, that have come from Canada and really have the freedom and mobility to leave at any moment with our passport, have this level of resistance and challenges that are 100% gender specific, then what does that mean for the, the eight-year-old girl or the 22-year-old woman or the, the widowed grandmother, you know, in the streets of Mogadishu? So I think that moment really was a watershed for both of us. And for me, it was the turnaround moment that I realized that I need to stay and I'm so much more useful here. <laughs> it really sounds like the pivotal moment was seeing this gender inequality in action more than anything else. Is that right? I feel like it was a, a combination of factors, but the gender inequality certainly was at the forefront of it, you know? Feeling that level of helplessness and then realizing that it's not only just cultural, but it's structural. It's infuriating. And we felt that running away is not an option. We have to create a better environment, not only for ourselves, not for our own mission, but for the majority of the population, which are women. And then also, we have an overwhelming majority of young people. More than 75% of the population is under the age of 30. So all of, all of this, these behaviors, these, these attitudes towards women and girls, it's, it's new. 
it's only one generation young. And that, that also gave me a lot of hope that this could be turned around because my mom's generation did not live with this level of inequality. There was no marginalization of women. Women were very public and they were outspoken and free and they could do and say whatever they wanted to. So all of this is some of the things that we've lost in the war and looking at how big the population of young people really are right now in Somalia, that presented an opportunity for me that this can be turned around as quickly as it turned to this disaster. It can be changed for the good. I don't know. I'm, I'm really drawn to the way that you chose to lean in, to step in, to show up in Somalia when, you know, ultimately you had the privilege and the, the opportunity to just head back to Canada and live, you know, your mom too, to live a normal, easy life. You know, you're women, you're young in Canada, you know, those aren't disqualifying factors. In fact, you you could almost argue that with that same grit and determination, you could have an incredible impact in Canada, but you still chose to show up in the place that's more difficult. You chose to show up in the place that wasn't easy for you. And I don't know, it's, it's beautiful to see the impact that you've been able to have by doing that, but that's not a no-brainer of a decision to make. And I would imagine that there were a lot of pressures from friends and, and it sounds like family to not be doing what you're doing. And so I have so much admiration for that. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I, of course, thought about it many times to just leave. And whenever I do feel challenged and frustrated, I still always kind of think about it, but it's nothing I could ever act on because I really believe countries like mine remain in conflict because of the critical mass that we're missing. Imagine millions of people have fled the war, but are still on the periphery looking into Somalia, watching the news, plugged in, following on social media, hoping one day for the country to become stable so that they can come back and go back, quote unquote, home. But if everyone just stays on the outside looking in, how are things supposed to get better? We definitely have a brain drain. I believe that we can all be so useful in places like this, but running away sometimes is just not an option. It's not. And I think I've learned so much about myself being here. I've learned that I'm much stronger than I am. And I learned about patience. I learned about community. All of these very important things that surely I could learn anywhere in the world. But really being here, I feel that every day I have an opportunity to live with purpose. Every day I have an opportunity to live intentionally and to serve. And I just feel so grateful for that opportunity. And it was scary to make that leap. But anything worth doing, I think it takes risks. You know, we have to gamble on what we think we can do and try it. Tell me about the work that you're doing. Tell me about your center and tell me about what you and your mom are, are, are doing in the community. I mean, the organization Elman Peace, at the core of it, we are a human rights institution. We focus on monitoring, documenting, reporting human rights violations and abuses that happen throughout the country. And we use that to inform the different programming and services that we provide. We are still in conflict. The recipe that my father accepted in the 90s is still a very core intervention of our work, which is drop the gun, pick up the pen. So we're still working with children and youth and now adults alike that have been um, conscripted into armed groups, whether they're the Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist group Al-Shabaab that they're fighting for or children that are under the age of 18 that are being used and recruited by the Somali military or whether they're clan-based militias, we are creating pathways. And how are they all getting pulled into those things? It varies. I mean, the most exploitative, aggressive, and widespread recruitment is by al-Shabaab. And they use everything from deception. We've had children as young as eight telling us they went with the armed group because they were promised school, free education, from anywhere from force. Children as young as 12, 13, their parents essentially being given an ultimatum, either pay us $30 a month, buy us weaponry, or give us your son to fight for us. And in an incredibly destitute situation where people can't buy them weapons, they can't pay $30 a month, they have no option but to take their sons. And others are just swept up in the community and taken into these forceful training camps. Others join what could be described as voluntarily, but 
we don't think it's voluntarily when the reasons for someone joining are for sustenance, for food, for survival. And these groups present as the only opportunity to actually eat and to take care of themselves and to be protected in an incredibly hostile environment. Children that have been orphaned throughout the war often find themselves just hanging around military barracks or military checkpoints, and they're raised by these soldiers. And as soon as they're old enough or strong enough to carry a weapon, they end up going to the front lines with them and fighting with them. And um, that's also a pathway for them to get registered in the national military. And one of the things that we advocate strongly on in Somalia is that the government and its international counterparts and its partners can't just look at the heinous recruitments being led by terrorist groups and turn a blind eye to the children that are guarding members of parliaments or the children that are actually on the front lines fighting alongside um, peacekeeping missions just because they're wearing the right uniform and they have the right flag on their shoulder. They're still children. So we provide opportunities for them, for adults that have become disillusioned by the ideology and have gone through the appropriate judiciary channels to be rehabilitated and reintegrated back into the community. And we support not just their own individual recovery, but we also work with the community to accept them back in, to sensitize them, to understand that um, taking them back in in the long term is a strategy towards peace as opposed to keeping them on the periphery. I would imagine that you've got a good amount of resistance to this. Obviously, there's the gender-based resistance to all of this, but you know, you've got you've got several different military and terrorist organizations that you are essentially pushing back against. Do you feel unsafe in what you do? Hmm. I mean, I think safety is relative as we see globally now. I mean, insecurity, attacks, anything can happen any moment, but I believe the risk is worth making. Even if we can just get one person disarmed, it's a step in the right direction for durable peace. I mean, I take as many mitigations to my security as possible, but at the end of the day, I I really believe, and I think this is something that really has been instilled in me by my mother and my father, a clear example of it. If you are sure in your convictions, then you'll be protected And if something happens, then it was meant to happen. (laughs) So I, I just live every day doing as much as I can. And, you know, if something happens, then it happens. But I, I don't dwell really on the security because in a place like Mogadishu, if you focus too much on the security and think about all the risks you're taking, you're going to be debilitated. You won't be able to do anything. So it's, I think it's always better to remain positive and, to really see the individual impact that we're making. And it's just incredibly enforcing. Every time I do see small success, shows me that we are doing the right thing and the risks that we take come with it. And it's definitely not just risks I carry on my own. We have an incredible, incredible team behind us and we we just support each other. And the community recognizes the work that we're doing, which I believe is our biggest mitigator of any kind of risks because we don't have eyes and ears everywhere but we have people that love us and believe in our mission and help keep us safe and i believe that i love that and that's a beautiful answer maybe within that i'm curious how you find joy in your day to day because you're doing impactful work some days i would imagine it's scary or overwhelming or heavy and you know you're dealing with child soldiers and people who have experienced great conflict and trauma, how do you continue to find joy and how do you combat the difficulty that's inherent in the work that you're doing? Yeah, it's, it is hard. It's heavy. It's, I feel like sometimes I'm carrying so much pain and it's hard really to express it, especially when you're supposed to be a pillar of strength for others. So this is something I'm uh, still trying to figure out, <laughs> but I feel like I, I find joy in seeing other people get happy and seeing people's lives change around. And I am so fortunate that I get to spend time with people that are just so excited about their future. 
You know, it's, it's so addictive to see someone that has come at a very vulnerable or destitute time in their life and is going through these different services. And now they have so much hope. It's, it's contagious seeing that level of excitement for the future from someone else. And being around that energy really is therapeutic for me too. We, we just set up this new center for, for babies that have been abandoned in the street that we've literally just been rescuing off the streets and they're, they're infants. They're so small and so beautiful and whenever I feel sad I do spend a lot of time there at the baby center because it just it's so exciting you know you just see a baby with his whole life in front of him or her and I find a lot of happiness in actually seeing ideas to help manifesting before me and actually being reality and people benefiting from it I'm constantly inspired so I don't feel like I ever really feel like I need to be recharged because inspiration is around me all the time. I do think that sometimes people that are aid workers in conflict don't get the appropriate mental health and psychosocial support that they need to continue to be this vessel or support structures for others. And this is an area that I'm I'm doing a lot more work in now, exploring alternative mental health techniques for people that are living or working in conflict zones. And we've been exploring things like surfing and yoga and painting for, and music therapy for, for looking at how that actually treats both the, the somatic symptoms of trauma and, you know, cognitive therapy through these approaches. And I use myself as a guinea pig all the time. I love it. So <laughs> it's really exciting to be able to look at even my own needs in these interventions and um, just make more friends along the way doing it with the beneficiaries that go through the same programs that I do. I think it's really beautiful that a lot of your joy comes from seeing people's transformations. There's something special about that because you are, you are in many ways responsible for those transformations happening. And so it's just this beautiful cyclical thing that you're doing. I'm so glad you brought this up because I wanted to mention, I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw our mutual friend, Bob Goff, uh, share a video in Somalia with a whole bunch of young boys surfing. And it was really incredible to see all of these kids. And and I don't, I don't know their backgrounds, if they're former child soldiers or people who've just experienced trauma, but it was beautiful seeing them up on the board for the first time, smiling, giggling, trying to figure it out. I went surfing for the first time earlier this year. It's so hard, but so satisfying. Oh my gosh. Tell me more about that. That makes me so happy. It wasn't it beautiful. I mean, it's, it's so simple, you know? I mean, it, it's true to our philosophy really that children can be children again, as long as they're just taken out of these contexts of violence. And that's what we try to do. We always try to answer the question of how do you teach or empower a child that's been stripped of his childhood to be a child again? And sometimes it's as easy as just like having beach days and showing them that they can be a kid, that life is not so serious. It's not about you know, feeding others or protecting or just be a kid. And we saw that when we started using surfing as a tool for therapy, for having conversations and dialogue at at the beach and getting these kids to work together to float, to, to feel safe in the water, to think about their problems and realize in the greater scheme of things, next to this big, massive body of water, how maybe little are what we think are the biggest problems are can really be. And to just be present and still. And those, those are some of the things that we've been doing at the beach. And Bob Goff is a, is a great, great friend and partner of our work. And with his support, we've been able to set up a safe house for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. And they were in Mukdishu visiting some of the girls that we support through the safe house. And we hadn't seen them for a couple of months. And on their last day before leaving Mukdishu, we had a beach day scheduled with the kids that we're doing the surfing program with, which is um, supported by this organization in South Africa called Waves for Change. And um, they all came out and it was just so much fun. It was so much fun because Debra, who's the executive director of Bob Goff's organization, is actually like a really great surfer. And it was just so much fun 
fun for them to see this like just super cool chick getting on the surfboard and just planting it every time, like standing up when they're still struggling with it. So that was also <laughs> really good. I think a win for what they think girls can do or not. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been in Somalia? I've been in Somalia since 2010. So wow. going on my eighth year. Yeah. So in the last, you know, seven, eight years, what has been some of the greatest progress that you've seen since you first got there? It sounds like a lot of it is bringing you so much joy. I mean, progress. I mean, it's really hard to really say like the specific change. But I mean, I look at the work that we do with survivors of sexual and gender-based violence as the most tangible and visible change. We started our first rape crisis center, the first rape crisis center in the country in just end of 2010. And we went from a position where the president at the time actually held a press conference saying that rape does not happen in the country. It does not happen in our religion, in our culture. Any organization or people talking about this issue are just trying to defame our government and our, and our culture. So we went from there in a period of short five years, six years, being able to generate a discussion on sexual violence that never before existed in the country, to having a sexual offenses bill that's being debated now in the parliament, to having a woman minister of human rights, which is a ministry that never before existed, to having more than 24% of women in parliament actually part of decision-making processes, and having gender-based violence and rape acknowledged as both a social and political issue. And I feel like that is tremendous change in such little time. And we've been able to see similar changes happening when we did a lot of advocacy that put a lot of our staff at risk, came with a lot of harassment and talking about issues like sexual exploitation and abuse and rape of children and women by peacekeeping troops. That put us in a very difficult position where the very people that were supposed to protect human rights activists we're becoming a source of those threats, but it did lead to gender focal points within the missions. It did lead to a huge decrease in the trend that otherwise was an open secret. Everyone saw this happening, but no one dared speak about it. And the same with the work that we're doing with child soldiers. It's still a very, very, very long way to go, but we now have an agreement with the government where any child that's captured or surrenders at the front lines has to be handed over to our centers within 72 hours. Wow, that's huge. It's huge. We have a lot of we have a long way to go, but if we don't acknowledge even the small wins, I think um, it's hard to to remain positive, but there's a lot of wins and I feel like there's we're making a dent and it's not it's not just us. I think people are just generally tired. They're tired of fighting and they're realizing that there's so much more that as a community, as a country, as youth we can do if we if we look at doing good instead of just fighting. So it's a good time to be in the business of selling hope and doing good. <laughs> so what's next for you? What's next for the center? What are you excited about right now? What I'm really excited about and um, one of the things that, you know, one thing that Somalia, as much as we try to remain positive, the reality is that things happen and a big reminder of that was just two months ago, October 14th, where the worst attack in Somali history happened. And the death count has just been released recently. And those that were killed and injured are close to 800 people in one minute, just completely gone. And that was really heartbreaking. And I didn't think something like that was still possible in Mogadishu, considering where it happened in downtown, the most protected and secure area. But things happen like that. But it did also inspire a lot of resolve and community and people contributing to security now that otherwise never did. So I'm hopeful for the direction we'll take moving forward. But I say that to say Somalia does remind you that everyone is expendable. Anything can happen. And I'm reminded by this by my father all the time. He was doing so much good and he was killed for the work that he was doing. But what did he leave behind? He left behind a tremendous legacy and people remember the impact of the work that he did. But it also was not institutionalized in the sense of after something happened to him, that ecosystem of support that was a lifeline 
for thousands of people dissolved. So what me and my mom are constantly working towards is sustainability. How do we not only provide people the individual support so that they can reclaim their lives, but how do we empower them to rebuild their entire communities so that the ripple effect continues well after we are here? And part of that is also why we've been working for the last three years to build a permanent space for us so that we don't have to worry every month about are these landlords going to charge us an extra 200 or extra $300 for rent? Are we going to have to close this women's center or this project ends? We're creating a space right now that's going to be the staple in our community and a constant place for reprieve and, and shelter and support and community for the most vulnerable women and children. And what I'm really excited about is just last year, I had very courageously invited um, a man that's considered to be the world's most prominent architect right now. He designed the wow. African-American Smithsonian in D.C. He was uh, crowned by Queen Elizabeth as a knight. Incredible person, incredible figure in architecture and design. And I read that he had visited every city, every capital city in Africa, but not Mogadishu. So I invited him to come and he came and then got to spend time with the kids in our programs, visit our centers. And he was inspired and agreed to design a vocational training center and a women's shelter for our program. Shut up. That's yes. amazing. I know. What? <laughs> so one of the things I'm really keen about is raising the funds to build the space in 2018 and getting one step closer to really institutionalizing and leaving our footprint in Somalia so that we can be free from all of these overhead administrative costs of running spaces that are so important for our community. Wow, man, that's so exciting. That's something amazing to be excited for. Congratulations. Thank you. I guess we should we should maybe start, I just want to keep on talking forever, but I feel <laughs> like we should start wrapping up. And, and I guess I'll wrap up by asking this. Ilwad, you've got this beautiful story of legacy and getting to carry on this legacy of your mother and your father and and having an impact in this way that, you know, is terrifying, but at the same time, joyful and hopeful and impactful. And for others who maybe their path feels a little bit less clear or others who maybe feel afraid, you know, what kind of advice, what kind of encouragement would you give them moving forward if they want to have an impact like you're having in your own unique way? I get a lot of questions from people that want to get involved, but are not in a position where they can come to Somalia or even want to come to Somalia, but they want to do something for their communities. And my, my go-to advice is always to first educate yourself on figuring out what are the issues that you care about and then figure out what already exists and don't look at how can you duplicate or how can you reinvent the wheel, but how can you collaborate and support and amplify positive things already happening in your community. And if they don't exist, then create them. But I really believe that for anyone that's inspired or is interested in the different issues and projects that we talked about in our conversation, one of the biggest challenges that activists and human rights defenders and people that are like myself on ground in the field face is that there's a limitation to what we can talk about openly when it comes to our advocacy. And the biggest and I believe most simplest form of support is just being an echo, being that level of solidarity outside that helps us to amplify our messaging and to help us carry forth these issues when you may have a safer space to do so. But for anyone that's interested in doing good for anyone, I believe it just starts with understanding really what's already happening in your community. How can you add value and not duplicate? And that comes from really reaching out and collaborating. I think collaboration is the key for us to have durable solutions to the various issues that exist. And that would be my first advice. Wow, there are so many things about my conversation with Ilwad that leave me so inspired and so speechless. Ilwad truly lives with this kind of passionate conviction that I think we all hope to emulate ourselves. In issue three of the Good Newspaper's feature story on Ilwad, we gave a couple of ways to support the people of Somalia. In fact, every page in the Good Newspaper ends with practical action steps on how we can get involved with the stories we just read. And here's what we said about the ways to support the people of Somalia. One, a good place to start is to fill your empathy bucket. 
A great way to do that is to search hashtag Future of Somalia on YouTube or even Twitter and Instagram and watch a few videos or read a few stories about the hopeful future many Somalis believe is in store for their country. Two, a way to go a step deeper would be to donate to support the impactful work being done by Elman Peace in Somalia. 100% of your online donation goes directly to projects. And number three, a way that you can get involved on an even deeper level without actually hopping on a plane to Somalia is to reach out to a local refugee organization to ask how you can support Somalis in your community. Many communities around the world, and especially the U.S., have taken in Somali refugees and you can be a part of providing them support. And lastly, I would highly encourage you to follow Ilwad Elman on social media. She's seriously so incredible. She's one of my favorite people to follow. She's great at Instagram, but she also gives you a sneak peek into this life in Somalia that, you know, I think a lot of us don't fully understand. You can find her everywhere, especially Instagram and Twitter by searching for Ilwad Elman. And one more time, you can visit elmanpeace.org to dive in more into the work that she's doing and the impact she's having around the world. If you're new to Sounds Good, we would love for you to stick around beyond this episode. You would also love our conversations with Jonathan Moya and Ahmed Bader, who both know something about welcoming strangers and heading up efforts to build bridges in their communities. You can find their episodes and all of our other episodes wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. This podcast was created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good, 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 a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit and mix the show, and Christy Karen Brock offers production support. You can get lots of hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at Good, Good, Good Co. And again, if you've been inspired at all by our conversation with Ilwa today or any of our past conversations, please consider subscribing to The Good News Paper. You can order it today and we'll start your year's worth of good news with our newest issue. Check it out and see what else we do at Good 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 at goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Remember to see each day as an opportunity to live with intentionality and the incredible opportunity to serve. Sound good?